Free coffee and donuts? And here's the thing, church is not any of those things. Church is a people, a group of people, who are passionate about following Jesus with everything inside of us. And that passion propels us to action. That's why we care for the poor and the homeless through local outreaches. We pick up and go when disaster hits and give help and hope to those in need, and we fight for freedom for people all over the world. With over 300,000 churches in America and 5 million in the world, the local church is able to do what no other group of people have ever been able to accomplish. Consider the church's influence on culture. So much of the world's art and architecture and literature and music has been and continues to be shaped by the local church. In 369 AD, the church built the first hospital and is still the largest provider of health care in history. The church was the first to stand up for the rights of children and created the largest orphanage system in the world. In a world where depression and loneliness run rampant, the church swings open its doors to provide rest for the weary. All of this comes out of the church's passion to show up with the same creativity, grace, and forgiveness that Christ showed us. And that's what it means to be the church. Maybe you'd say, all this sounds great, but it's not really my scene. I didn't grow up in church. It's never been a big part of my life. Well, here's the thing, you're here. And maybe you're here because you have found yourself in a place you never thought you would be. Maybe you're feeling alone, just exhausted. We've all experienced pain, a broken heart, loss of a family member, a friend. Maybe you'd say, I was just looking for a momentary escape from life, or I just didn't know where else to turn. Whatever the reason, let me just say, in this moment, you're home. So whether you're joined up with a group of people in a home church, you're in a small country church, you're in a new millennium kind of place with big screens and lights, or you're watching online, whatever it is, lean in, pull up a seat, and know that this is a place for you to find purpose, a place for you to find community, to find a family. This is a place for you to belong. Welcome to church. Good morning, praise God. Good morning. Let's try that one more time. It doesn't like it when you switch from one computer to the next. <laughs> Do that. That's okay. We'll get this right. Now let's try. Nope. It's okay. We survived without it for so long, didn't we? Now when it goes amok, I don't know. Praise God. I want to invite everybody tonight or today after service to join us for our, uh, our church picnic. Uh, it's not supposed to rain, so we're going to do it outside. Amen. We got everything set up outside. I hope you saw that when you came in. Um, but then uh, enjoy it. Amen? Yes. Are you all with me this morning? Yep. I hope so. I hope so. A uh, couple things uh, I want to announce. Um, our new, uh, on Wednesday nights, we're having um, Royal Rangers Missionettes. That's our boys program. Our girls, or our boys and girls club. So we get together with the boys and girls, have a good time, have Bible study. But we also have an uh, adult Bible study that goes on at then, and it starts at 6 o'clock, but we're starting something new. We have a new class for infants and toddlers. So, you know, if you have little ones, they can come now and, uh, and be a part of that. On Friday night, be in prayer for this, September the 28th, from 6 to 10 o'clock, our girls' event is, um, is happening, and uh, it's for girls only. Um, 
and, and some women that are that help out with that, but it's called Breaking the Code, Unlock the Mystery, Breaking the Code, Unlock the Mystery Code. All girls are welcome, and if you if you see uh, Taylor Powers, yeah, raise your hand a little bit more than if you want to volunteer, you can see her. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And then uh, be in prayer for Wednesday, October the 31st. I know this is uh, more than a month away, but uh, we've already put out some things. Um, and that's our, we're having it on Wednesday night, and we're actually going to be doing a, a fall harvest celebration here at 6 o'clock. If you see my wife, yes, you knew how to raise her hand. Um, for information and, and uh, to help out with that, that'd be greatly appreciated. And uh, as always, um, our food pantry. Remember our food pantry. Amen. You don't have to just buy food for it. You can also get money. Amen. We're going to try this one more time, see if it'll work. Look at that. How you like that? How you like them apples? Our children can be dismissed to Children's Church, uh, and they're all excited about coming uh, and being part of our uh, church picnic. Well, if you have your Bibles there, uh, I hope you can turn to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be jumping around Ephesians a little bit here. But have you ever felt like you haven't belonged? You ever been in a place where like you're, you're just out of place, you, you really shouldn't be there. It's, it's like you're on the outside looking in. Uh, whether it was like, if you go back to your, your for, first day of a new school and you really don't know anybody if you moved or anything like that. Those of you who are in the military or military children know what it's like to, to move around a, a little bit and you know have to experience that over and over again. You're, you're, you're new, you don't fit in. Or what about the, the first day on a new job? Or how about this one? Have you ever gone to a wedding as someone's date? You were there plus one. I mean, you feel out of place there. Or what about this? You're newlywed, and within the first year of you guys being newlyweds, you go to your spouse's family reunion. You really don't know the stories yeah you know who people are kind of they went to your wedding but or you hope they did but the uh you, you just kind of feel out of place because you don't know the history behind all the stories they tell or the reminiscing that they do uh you know there there are times when we all feel like we're just kind of like outside that we don't belong and we don't like that feeling do we we really don't like the feeling of, what am I doing here? Now, sometimes that could be good. Because it sometimes God will let you feel that way because you're in a place that you shouldn't be. Amen? But at other times, it's just like, man, I, I just, you feel like an outsider and you don't belong. And we hate that. But here's the question. Have you ever felt like that in church? Have you ever felt like, there's a conversation that's going on and you kind of miss something. Like everyone else knows what's going on, what's happening. And you don't know what's going on or what's happening. It's kind of like everything is for them and, and you're kind of just stuck watching. Watching what's going on. Not really being able to participate. Well, our message of scripture for today has something to say to you. Today's message is for those who on the playground, when the captains picked the teams, you were picked last. Or the ones that didn't have a date to the prom, or those who didn't make the team, or, or make the play, or the choir, or, or the band. This message for those whose marriages are struggling, for those who are divorced, or whose kids won't talk to them. This is a message for those who are confused, filled with doubt, and worry over things that they have little or no control over. And today's scripture has a message for those who are broke, those who are addicted, those who have sexual sin in their lives. This is a message for the messed up, the imperfect, and those who wake up crying in the middle of the night. 
This message is for the one who is sick, the one who has become forgetful, and the one who is grieving. This is for the one who got a speeding ticket yesterday, the one who has a history they'd rather forget, and the one who's still paying for consequences for poor decisions in the past. This is for those who are imperfect, those who come to church today feeling like a phony, a fake, an imposter, those who sin. This is a message for those of us who have ever felt like they were on the outside looking in. And the message is quite simple. You belong here. You belong here. You are in the perfect place this morning. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you, Lord God, that you have invited us to be a part of your household, part of your family. Lord, we don't have to be on the outside looking in, but you love us so much. Help us to redeem the time this morning to get into your word and have it get into us so that we can live by your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I know that there are times in church that uh, it, it appears that, that we make it look like church is for, or Jesus is, is for the people who are perfect, who have, who have it all together. We want to make it seem like we have somehow earned this, this station in the eyes of God. That Jesus loves us because of something we did on our own. We want to build ourselves up into something fantastic, special. But the truth is, we're not. We're just as much a, a mess as other people around us every day. It's almost like we don't belong here either. And apparently, this is what was happening in the, with the people of Ephesus, and they were dealing with this. For some reason, they were feeling like the, that they didn't belong. Why? Because they weren't Jewish. Paul, who was a Jewish preacher, had told them about Jesus. He was a, a, a Jewish Messiah. And while they had accepted Jesus and wanted to follow him, they felt like that, that newlywed at his in-laws family reunion. There were things that were going on, a story that they didn't know, and it made them feel like second-class citizens in church. Now, church, I want to talk a little bit about this church. When Paul uses the word church, he's not talking about the same way that we do, and I've talked about this for several weeks. The word ecclesia, a gathering. Paul doesn't isn't talking about church like we do. He wasn't surely wasn't he talking he wasn't even thinking about Middle River Assembly of God. As a matter of fact, he probably wasn't even thinking about the assemblies of God. As a matter of fact, I believe that in some sense, he wasn't even talking about the universal church, everybody who believes in Jesus, who's following Jesus. I think Paul was thinking broader than that because at the end of Ephesians chapter 1, listen to what he writes about the church. He says that he, God, has put all things under his, meaning Jesus, under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I want you to think about that. For Paul, the church is the fullness of Jesus who fills all in all. The church in this context, the church in this, in this, in this way of thinking is that we are, the church, is, is like God's presence here on earth. Do you understand that? We are the body of Christ. 
We are the ones who have the work that God has us for, for us to do. The church is the fullness of Jesus. And here's the great part about that. We are invited to come and participate in that. We can participate in the plan of God. Now, when you look at the first century church, it's not unlike our churches, our churches today. There was division in the church. And there was this clear divide in the uh, Ephesians. And then they seem to be caught up in this, in this divide. In the words of Paul, there's a division between the Jewish and the Gentile Christians. And as we read this morning, Paul identifies the Ephesians as Gentiles. Or in one place, the uncircumcision. It simply means that the Ephesians were not Jewish. And while there doesn't seem to be a particular controversy driving this conversation, Paul feels the need to tell the Ephesian Christians that they are not second-class citizens in the church or the kingdom of God. You belong here, is what he was saying. Like us, when we don't feel like we have it all together, when life is rough, when we're doubting God and ourselves, the Christians in, in, the, in Ephesus were wondering if this faith was really for them. They, were on the, they felt like they were on the outside looking in, and they, they were wondering if they, they could really fully participate in this thing called church because they really didn't have the, the Jewish heritage. They didn't know the stories. They didn't know what was going on in a, in a lot of circumstances. Paul's answer to the, Ephesians, to the Ephesian Christians was is to remind them of the work of Jesus. And that work that welcomed them into the family. He writes this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. He says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God. Think of that. They, even though they were outsiders, they were aliens at one time, have been brought in because of the blood of Jesus Christ into the household of God. Same with us. I like how... Uh, Eugene Peterson, the message, puts it. This is the, the message here. He goes, you belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. See, in their thoughts, because of what the Jewish people being, being the chosen group, the chosen ones, God's chosen people, they, they, were, they were feeling like they couldn't be a part of that. But God said, you belong here. There are times I must, I must confess that I, don't feel, I feel like a, a Christian imposter. As if everyone fool, I have everyone fooled into thinking that I'm something that I'm not. And it, it's interesting. Maybe you didn't come here today because you didn't... Uh, maybe you didn't want to come today because you didn't want to pretend that you had it all together. Maybe you came... You know, frustrated over a, a death of a friend or feeling confused about what what is God doing allowing a, a hurricane like Florence to pummel North and South Carolina. Or maybe you fought with your spouse this morning. Maybe you feel like you're just putting on a face. The good news about the gospel is Jesus came for people just like me and you. Confused hurting, in pain, with struggles, worry. God came, Jesus came for people just like us who have so much going on in their lives. To people like us, people who feel like we're on the outside looking in, those of us who feel like we're, we're, in the, we're at that reunion and we just don't understand. Those of us who are, have been or still are on the, on the perceived to be on the wrong side of the issues. Jesus has come near to us to draw us near to him. And this was Paul's passion for ministry. Paul was called to, to welcome the, or to extend an invitation to the non-Jewish people, the ones who didn't belong, the uncircumcision, those on the outside of God's family in Jesus Christ. A message he received from Jesus, who, would, who would, uh, would really, if you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus was always in trouble for being with the wrong people, wasn't he? <laughs> wrong people. 
Why are you hanging out with, with, with sinners and prostitutes and tax collectors? And you should be hanging out with us religious folk, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes. He was always getting in trouble for hanging out with the wrong people. But this is what Paul said later in chapter, in the same letter, uh, the third chapter, chapter, he opens it up with this. He says, this is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. This was his purpose. It would have been much safer. It would have been much, made much more sense for this Pharisee of Pharisees, is what he called himself. He was a Jew's Jew. It would have been much easier and safer for him to stay in Jerusalem, to preach the gospel there. But that was not his call. Instead, he travels around to the, the known world to share the message of Jesus. And as a matter of fact, sometimes he even bumped noses with the leaders in Jerusalem over certain things. Eugene Peterson, Peterson shares in his uh, book, Practice Resurrection, this is what he says. There is considerable irony in the probability that this negative definition was given to the first Gentile Christians by Jewish Christians representing the church, talking about the uncircumcision. Okay? But it's understandable. Jews had a long history as the people of God. They had a well-developed sense of, of being a chosen people, which they were. But along with that, they had also devoted an, 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 an entrenched prejudice against non-Jews as a rejected people, which they were not. That's Eugene Peterson in Practice Resurrection. It might be easy for us to, to look down on those first century Jewish Christians for being exclusionary. <coughs> It might be easy for us to, to, to be down on them if people in the 21st century didn't look at us the same way. We don't have the best reputation, church. We really don't. We have a, we have a reputation of making people feel unwelcome. We're sometimes called quite unfairly judgmental, hypocritical, navel gazing and much more the church has a reputation though I believe it's unfair of being anti everything and for nothing you might not you, you and I know that's not the truth as a matter of fact right now down in the Carolinas uh, because of Hurricane Florence. When it strengthened to a Category 4 hurricane, Convoy of Hope dis deployed. Convoy of Hope deployed. That's fine. See if I can shut it down. There it is. Convoy of Hope. They deployed the vast disaster service team. On Wednesday morning, Convoy of Hope responded ahead of the storm with an advanced team on the ground to assess the storm. On Thursday, Convoy of Hope sent a full team to the area with equipment and several truckloads of disaster relief supplies from their World Distribution Center in Springfield, Missouri. Convoy of Hope's goal in responding to Hurricane Florence is to give people help and hope in times of great need. Teams in the field will distribute relief supplies to storm, provide, uh, storm survivors, co coordinate with volunteers and assist in cleanup efforts. Convoy of Hope will be working closely with local, state, and federal officials in this response. That is their goal. They have responded to more than 360 international and domestic disasters since 1994, delivering 
more than 516 tractor trailer loads of relief supplies in 2017 alone. That's astounding. They are a part of the assemblies of God. This is the kind of stuff that the church does. Our bad <laughs> reputation as happens as happens with so many prejudices come from bad actions of a small group of people who are very vocal, while the good stuff that the churches do goes unnoticed. We have, been, we have a great way of bringing people together when we need to. That's the great thing about the church. You, know, you saw it on the video this morning. The church was the one that built the, that built the, the, the greatest hospitals in the world, and, and they're the ones that build the orphanages set up the new, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, where there was no orphanages. Before the church came along, before Christians were there, there were no orphanages. People would just allow their babies to die in the street. No one to take care of them. When the Black Plague came along, it was the Christians who stayed behind to care for the sick and the dying. See, People forget about that. People forget about that. But then again, I've been around Christian people who have made me uncomfortable themselves. Maybe you've been there too. It's tempting to get caught up as, as those first century Jewish Christians did into believing that we have been chosen by God. Isn't it? That we somehow have an inside track to God. As this as if we've been chosen by God and others have been rejected by God. I pray that I'd never do that to someone else, but I'm guessing that I have. It's funny, when, people, when I meet people and then they find out I'm a pastor, especially like at work, I meet new people at work, they come into the shop, they start, they start talking and you know, they find out I'm a pastor, and then they start watching their language. It's amazing. I have one guy, he, he, he's been around me for, oh, probably 20 years. And when he slips up, he'll say, oh, I'm sorry, Mike. It's like I'm ranking people. It's like they think I'm ranking them to see which tier of heaven they can get into, like, you know, like Dante. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 it's funny how people respond to that. Well, we may not intend it, I believe that there are times when we put up walls to make people feel as though they're on the outside looking in. Which, I, without much thought, you know, we as, we as churchgoers, we, we uh, slip into this Christian ease. It's a language all our own. And we don't, you know, sometimes the people coming in who are new to us, they don't understand what we're talking about. We don't hang out. We have fellowship. Right? We're going to have a, a picnic today, and we're not going to hang out with each other. We're just going to fellowship with each other. Where, in that, where else in the world do we use that word like that, fellowship? What about words like sanctuary? Or I like calling it a foyer because people have foyers in their homes. But I know some people that call our foyer the vestibule. <coughs> what in the world is a vestibule? Okay? Maybe that's a term from long ago. I don't know. Have you ever met somebody who, who, when something happens, you say, oh, man, that was a great coincidence. And somebody goes, well, I don't believe in coincidence. It was a God incidence. You know what I meant. You ever met people like that? Maybe you have felt that way, all judged and, and, and sized up and evaluated. Could you imagine, and I know some of you can because this is recent for you, can you imagine what it's like as a first-timer coming to church? Who else talks about bulletins? Or what about tithes 
is offering. Sometimes in, in very in, unintentional ways, we can be constructing walls, delineating the insiders from the outsiders in the church. But the truth is, we belong. And they belong just as much as we do. Those people who we don't agree with. The ones who voted for the other guy. They belong here too. I get so frustrated when I see so many pastors on Facebook just, just getting so political and, and pulling down. They call it the opposition. That's not my purpose. My purpose is to encourage, to bring people into the knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus. Amen? Amen. But all those other people that, that don't believe like we believe, you know what? They belong here too. Because this church is not built here for us. Oh, yes, we are the church. But you know, we exist. So that other people can come to know Jesus and become a part of his loving household. Amen? Amen. At the end of chapter 3, after talking about the, this church where the Ephesian Christians belong and, and how he was the, uh, his role as an evangelist to the Gentiles, Paul launches into a prayer of thanksgiving. And it's really a quite um, eloquent, moving prayer. And it includes this in chapter 3, uh, verses 18 and 19. This is what it says. says this, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. This is what it says, this is how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message. He said, I ask him, that with both feet planted firmly on love, you'll be able to take in, with all the followers of Jesus, the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breadth. Test its length. Plumb the depths. Rise to the heights. Live full lives, full in the fullness of God. This morning, as, as you came in, we had a song playing on uh, <coughs> over the, as you were coming in, there was a song playing. It's a song by John Mark McMillan. And he wrote that song in a very difficult time in his life. He wrote it when, after a friend had been tragically killed in an automobile accident, and, and McMillan went through this dark period of doubt and anger with God. He began to wonder if God had really cared for him at all. God turned the question on him, and, and McMillan came to realize that God loved him when his friend was killed and continued to love him even in his doubt and his anger. And he wrote that chorus. <clears throat> We've sung it here. The chorus that goes, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. He loves us. Amen. And if you walk out of here not remembering anything else, I, I pray that you remember this, that he loves you. He loves you. He loves you in your doubt and in your anger, in your fear and worry. In your messed up relationships, he loves you. Whatever you think that might that, that you think might keep God from loving you, he loves you. And he loves you with a love that is beyond understanding. I pray that you reach out and experience that breath. Test the length of his love. Plumb the depths of his love and rise. To its heights. You belong here. They belong here. 
because of the love of Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I praise and I thank you, Lord God, for this morning. Lord, I thank you. For Lord God, you just your grace and your mercy that you've given to us. I thank you for each person that is here, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that you would just minister even now to us. Speak to our hearts. Let us realize your great love for us. And Lord, how we how we need to have that love for others. That you don't look at our backgrounds, you don't look where we came from, you don't look where, uh, what's going on in our lives, and then you decide to whether or not you're going to love us. But you love us all the same. And I thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, I pray for each person that doesn't know you personally. That you would already speak to their hearts, Holy Spirit. Jesus. Everybody's still praying, heads bowed. You may come in here this morning thinking, I don't even know why I'm here. I don't know why I'm watching this on Facebook. I don't know why I'm watching this on YouTube. But for some reason, I am. It's because God has brought you to this point. God has brought you here. So that you could hear that he loves you so much. You may go, how do I know that he loves me? The Bible tells us, Paul writes in Romans. He says that God proved his love towards us in this. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That means that while I was a sinner, God loved me so much and wanted a relationship with me that Jesus died on the cross for you. He died on the cross for you because he wants a relationship with you. He loves you that much. If that speaks to your heart this morning and you feel a, a pull, like, what do I do with that information? What do I do now? How can I accept this love? Just bow your heart and your head. Ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to come in and make you a new person. And ask him to accept you into the household of faith. pray this this morning. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for my sins. I confess my need for you. I need your forgiveness, your grace, and your mercy. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new person. I now give my life to you because you gave your life for me. Help me, Holy Spirit, to grow in my knowledge of who you are. 